We are back at it in the uh, Gospel of Luke, and we saw today's passage portrayed in that, uh, in that video, starting with verse 17 of chapter 6. That were, that's where we are so far in our uh, kind of slow walk through the red-lettered words, the words of Jesus in Luke. And verse 17 starts with saying that he, Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. Now, I suppose uh, we should consider who is them, right? He said Jesus went with them, and uh, where did they come from? So for answers to those questions, we can, we can look to the preceding verses. It said uh, in verse 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now, we aren't told what motivated Jesus to pray on the mountain, what drove him to pray that way that day. We're not told if he had specific intention. We don't know uh, that he started with these 12 in mind that we'll get to in the text. And in fact, the way the text reads, it, it doesn't even indicate that Jesus started with the plan to pray through the night. Maybe he did, but I kind of think maybe he didn't. It may have been that Jesus just prayed until he was finished. <laughs> just prayed until he was finished praying. And I know that I could do a better job of allowing for times, even expecting for times to get stuck in prayer like this, praying until finished. What drove him there? I, I don't know for sure, but if we were to consider the context, it could be that Jesus was praying because of opposition from the religious leaders. That's a pretty good uh, uh, policy, by the way, when we're wondering uh, uh, what, what's going on in a passage of Scripture. It's always good to consider the context and, and see how the dots might connect. So backing up often is a good way to answer the questions. What's going on here? We may not know precisely what motiv motivated Jesus to pray, nor the content of his pray, but we do know... The results, it says, when morning came, Jesus called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. It says he called his disciples to him and, and, and chose 12 of them, which kind of indicates that he called a bunch of them and chose a subset. <laughs> I wonder how many were there that morning. I wonder if those... Who, uh, who didn't get picked, I wonder if they minded. I mean, they were all disciples. They were all followers of Jesus devoted to his teaching. But these 12 were chosen, it says, called by Jesus for special work, to be apostles, it says. Those sent out as messengers with delegated authority, apostles. Apostles. I'm all but certain that, uh, that they had no idea what that meant. They had no idea what being an apostle meant. Uh, they seemed so clueless about what the future would hold. We'll see this as the story plays out, as the narrative progresses through Luke. And they just couldn't imagine what, what God would accomplish in and through them. Nor could they comprehend the sacrifice that would demand, be demanded of them. He called them apostles, called them apostles. Now, we usually only commend a title to someone after they've qualified for it, right? Um, I earned the uh, title reverend, for example, after uh, some academic rigor, uh, periods of ob observation, experience in ministry, and such. Um, I know that a few of you here have earned the title doctor after a, a great deal of academic rigor. Uh, one of you uh, earned the, uh, the title doctor because I suggested it in the right executive committee meeting. Because <laughs> we've got Dr. Don argue, real doctorate, worked hard for it. Dr. Pat argue, that's a, real, uh, uh, that's a real doctorate as well, but it's, it's an honorific. 
She worked for it, but not in the usual way. She worked for it in prayer and service and loyalty. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Don. The point is, is that we tend to only commend a title to someone after they've qualified for it. In these instances, the title is descriptive, acknowledging work and qualification. But here the title of apostle is more predictive than descriptive, right? More a matter of the promised plan of God. This wasn't their graduation with honors from Jesus University. <laughs> it was their letter of acceptance to the admissions office, really. Or perhaps more accurately, this was their draft notice. <laughs> their draft notice. So he went down with them. And stood on a level place, and a large crowd of disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over, from all over, it says. From Judea, the whole region, from Jerusalem, the holy city, the capital, and from the coastal regions around Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So there was Jesus and the twelve and a large crowd, a diverse crowd. Like I said, from the area, from the region, from the capital, and even from uh, out of the country, Tyre and Sidon, for example, called out here in the text, were on the coast of the Mediterranean up north in Lebanon. It could be that those from Tyre and Sidon weren't even Jews at all, Gentiles like me and most of you. In true to form, Jesus met the needs of those gathered in seeking his help. Those troubled with impure spirits were cured healed, delivered. People tried to touch him because power was coming from him and he was healing them all. So then we get to verse 20 and we finally get some red letters, some words of Jesus. And he said, blessed. Blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now for you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you'll laugh. Blessed. I mean, this is so upside down to how we generally think. I mean, just think, even knowing what we know and seeing what we see and understanding what we, just hearing the words, words of, of God here, if we came across someone who was obviously poor and hungry, if we came across someone like that who was weeping, would we think that that one was blessed? Well, of course not. In fact, if you came across someone like that and said, oh, you must be blessed, you could get punched in the nose. You probably deserve it. <laughs> blessed? Of course not. Really, seriously. You might want to somehow bless that one because poor and hungry and crying, it would seem that they would need to be blessed at that point. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Blessed are you when people hate you. Wow. <laughs> they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of me, he says, because of the Son of Man. This is even more startling. I mean, we can be glad for the promise of Jesus that include the kingdom of God, the promises of Jesus that include satisfaction, the promise of Jesus for joyful laughter. But here's another promise. Those within his hearing that day were certainly that Jesus was healing and delivering people, but there's another promise here. The promise embedded here is not so wonderful. Sure, the promise was of blessing, but there was also the promise of insult, of rejection, of hate. It says when people hate you, <laughs> not if. It says when people insult you, not maybe. It says when people exclude you, it's going to happen, he says. When, that's a promise. He says followers of Jesus, those who belong to him can count on all of this. And I'm sure that if we took the time, we could reveal stories along these lines, even among those who are gathered here today. And if we were to broaden our view, if we were to broaden our thinking, if we were to expand our scope and consider the plight of Christian brothers and sisters around the world, we could reveal far more dangerous circumstances. It's true. But nevertheless, Jesus says rejoice. <laughs> rejoice in that day. Rejoice in the day of insult and exclusion, hatred, 
Rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. He says that's the way it's always been. That's how they treated the prophets. And then Jesus continues, not merely specifying blessings, but exposing the flip side. Woe to you who are rich. (laughs) Woe to you who are well fed. Woe to you who laugh. Woe when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. I titled the message, uh, Blessings, because... When you look at the passage, it seems like that's a prominent theme. Blessings, right? I wasn't going to call it woes. <laughs> I mean, seriously. That'd just be weird. I mean, we don't even often use the word woe these days. Woe, Brother Steve. <laughs> what dost thou? No, we don't use the word woe. <laughs> It'd just be weird. Whoa, it's a warning. It's a warning of of doom. A warning of coming horrors. On this day when we're trying to uh, uh, recruit people to work in the nursery and the uh, the preschool, I can hear woes coming from, uh, I mean, I can hear them all the way up. Do you hear that? Somebody shut the doors for crying out loud. No, don't, I'm kidding. Whoa, doom, coming horrors. I guess some folks do like to go to a church where the preaching is a lot about woes. More scaring people out of hell than welcoming them into heaven. That's just not how we're wired around here. I at least try to be a little more sneaky, a little more subtle about the the woes here. No, we're more more blessing people. More often than not, we're we're blessing people. I, I often end my email messages with just that. Blessings, exclamation point. You ever get an email from me? You might see that. Blessings. I suppose it's a a nice sort of Christian thing to say, but I really mean it. And I often, when I get to the end of the email there, I have my my email program, like, automatically put it in. So I remember to to pray for people, to bless people. Asking God to, to bless them. Asking God to bless their day, their work, their relationships and such. We're blessings people. Not woes. But it could be that the best word to sum up the passage, this passage, is a word that isn't even found in the passage. But it is certainly implied. And that word is humility. I think the point here in these blessings and woes is humility. With these blessings and woes, Jesus is teaching humility. Think through this with me. Rewind back a little bit. Jesus went to the mountain to pray. Jesus went up the mountain to meet with God, to pray. Some see in this scene something like the account of Moses in the book of Exodus. Right? Moses went up the mountain to meet God. But where Moses came down with tablets containing commandments, Jesus came down with names Jesus came down with people who had changed the world, (laughs) becoming his apostles, his empowered and sent ones. And I think not just those 12, but all those that would follow. Moses came down with commands of God. Jesus came down with those who would speak the word of God, filled with the spirit of God, doing the work of God. Now, like I said, it could have been that the opposition from religious, religious leaders was a large part of what drove Jesus to the mountain to pray that day. And God answered. God's answer was to change the leadership. Not only replacing the leaders with maybe the names that we read there in the text, but also replacing the the entire construct of leadership, turning the whole thing upside down. Like I said, these 12 were not immediately installed as leaders, but they were by no means ready to be apostles, yet a lot would happen. Things 
they couldn't even imagine before they would be ready. But now drafted. Now with this promised plan of God, now drafted, now enrolled in this academy for spiritual leadership led by Jesus, there was a first lesson to be taught, and the lesson was this, humility. Humility. I hope everyone would agree that Jesus is a different kind of leader. And he was calling, is calling, a different kind of leader. They would be different than what they saw from other leaders, perhaps especially the religious leaders. Likely different than anything they could even imagine, different than what they expected even from themselves. This is what Jesus calls from his people, humility. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Now, is this a matter of net worth? The sorts of things measured by spreadsheets and balances and in bank accounts and such? I'm certain that this is so much more than a matter of numbers, but more a matter of perspective and attitude. When we think we're rich, when we seek satisfaction in wealth and all that goes with it, well, then we've received our comfort. But when we consider ourselves poor, when we rely on God for provision, when we hold loosely to the possessions and wealth and all, then we are blessed. Then the kingdom, the promise says, is ours. Blessed are you. Jesus is telling his future leaders, telling us, telling you and me, blessed are you who hunger now, for you'll be satisfied. But woe to you who are well fed now, for you'll go hungry. Again, not merely, this isn't just merely about, about food in our bellies, but a matter of spiritual hunger, a hunger to serve God, a hunger to serve others, a hunger to do God's will, a hunger for more of God. That's what this hunger is all about. Blessed are you who weep now, who mourn, who are sorrowful, for you will laugh, but woe to you who laugh now, for you will weep and mourn. Now, Jesus isn't against laughing. <laughs> I'm glad that there's laughing promise for eternity. But laughing at sin, laughing because we have our stuff at the expense of others, laughing along those lines, this isn't, for, this isn't blessing, but rather, this, is the, 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 uh, this results in woes. Blessed are you, it says. Blessed are you when you hate when people hate you, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, because of Jesus, but rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward. That's how they treated the prophets. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how our ancestors treated the false prophets. This one seems particularly countercultural these days, I think. Right? Because these are the days of populism. These are the days of popularity contests, of needing to be, wanting to be, insisting on being liked. These are the days of celebrities. These are the days of influencers, populist leaders, populist politicians, populist CEOs, even populist pastors. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but it's award season. It's an award season. Golden Globes and Grammys and Oscars and such. Lots of awards for the, for the beautiful people, the famous award season. I heard somebody say that the reason we have so many award shows is because celebrities are so self-centered that they make up new ways to congratulate one another. <laughs> now, that's interesting it made you chuckle. But that isn't the real reason there are so many award shows. That is not the reason there are so many award shows. It's not because celebrities are self-congratulatory, as if the rest of us aren't. <laughs> 
There are so many award shows. There are award shows for the same reason there is any kind of other show. You know why there are award shows? They make money. That's right. <laughs> they make money. And you know why they make money? They make money because there's demand. Because people love this stuff. People love celebrities. When we watch them get their awards in their pretty clothes, the music and the lights and such, we, we kind of worship them in a way. And golly, we'd like to be like them. Now, I know a lot of you don't watch these sorts of things and don't want to be like them, but a lot do. <laughs> More than enough to sway culture and make lots and lots of money. It isn't all that unusual to hear some words that sound like humility as they receive their awards, right? I mean, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Thank you. I can't believe it. <laughs> I just can't believe it that I've received this award. But really? <laughs> then why do you dress up like that? <laughs> why do you have notes? <laughs> why do you have a speech? I mean, they are actors for the, I mean, seriously. <laughs> it seems that true humility is rare. It's award season. It's, it's not only award season. Uh-oh, here I go. Just for a minute. Bear with me. It's politics season. It's politics season. It seems these days um, that uh, maybe all seasons are politics season, but it is especially politics season now. This is a, a year for a national election, right? A year when we elect a president, so it's ramping up. The uh, first in the nation caucuses were held in Iowa last week, and New Hampshire will have the first primary uh, tomorrow, right? So it seems simple, right? I say we elect the one who demonstrates humility. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> That's simple enough. Let's elect the humble one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the dilemma, isn't it? I mean, there isn't one. I've been listening from humility in the campaigning, and I haven't heard anything like, like humility. In fact, we don't expect humility. I don't even know if we want humility from presidential candidates, do we? We might like some humility, but good luck on that. Good luck on that. I mean, there was scarce little humility in that whole impeachment embarrassment. No humility from either side. Uh, of course it wasn't a perfect call, seriously. <laughs> But of course it wasn't impeachable. Of course there was some kind of, I guess, abuse of power. Yeah, but that's, that's what we do with power. Isn't that what power's for, to abuse? I mean, seriously. It's hardly anything out of the ordinary. I'm pretty simple about this stuff. It seems to me that if President Trump was guilty of anything in this whole embarrassment, it was that he was guilty uh, of not being a crafty and skilled politician. <laughs> he was just so clumsy and ham-handed about all this stuff. Not a skilled politician, but a skilled populist, for sure. Like the results he gets or not, like his style or not, the president is a skilled populist, skill that uh, the pundits say will likely earn him another term. Now listen, about pointing out any of this to support a candidate. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that our culture is a populist culture, a celebrity culture, a culture that really values when everyone speaks well of you. It could be our highest value. Our leaders are most often the results of popularity contests. I mean, it even goes for pastors. <laughs> I don't blame our politicians or any of our leaders really for being the way that they are because we get what we demand. 
I think in a lot of ways we get what we deserve. We want the popular ones who say popular things, perhaps now more than ever, but it has uh, been the human condition throughout history. Jesus pointed it out right here in our text. Friends, this isn't about presidents or celebrities or politicians. It isn't even about the choices we will make in elections. This is about us. <laughs> this is about us. The kind of people that we will be, the kind of people that Jesus is calling, the kind of leaders that he's calling. Perhaps you think of yourself as a leader. I mean, I do. I get to do this and all. I have le I'm a leader in various ways. But friends, we all have opportunities to lead now and we'll have opportunities to lead down the road. Jesus told his disciples that they would lead in ways that they couldn't even imagine. And here is the first lesson for leadership it's our primary lesson for leadership, too. And our lesson for followership, I suppose, following Jesus. And the lesson is this, humility. Jesus calls for something different. Jesus calls for something that is upside down from what is usual in our human way of thinking. Our human way of thinking drives us to desire to be rich. It drives us to, be, to desire to be well-fed, it, is, it, it, it drives us to desire to be happy and joyful and laughing. It drives us to des desire to be popular. This is our human way of thinking, but Jesus calls us to something that's upside down. Jesus calls us to, to humility. Jesus calls us to be poor and hungry and mourning, to rejoice when suffering for his name, to rejoice for, when suffering for his cause, to rejoice when suffering for his character and his work, working in us and through us. God help us to turn our natural thinking upside down. I mean, really? God help us. Because this is a work of the Spirit. You think you can will this to be? I don't think so. This is a work of the Spirit. These are the kinds of things that come from the hand of God, that come from the heart of God. The kinds of things that if we really want them, we go to the mountain to pray. So perhaps you find yourself today poor, hungry, and mourning today in some way. Friend, you are closer to the kingdom, closer to Jesus than you may have realized. Let's all find ourselves closer to Jesus and his kingdom. God help us. God help us to be poor, <laughs> hungry, mourning, Help us to turn our natural thinking upside down. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. It's about that time. Why don't you stand with me? And let's pray together. Father, we take this moment to, uh, to humbly approach you. We don't need to go to some mountain in some faraway place. You welcome us into your, uh, into your presence, into your heart. In a moment just like this to, to pray. Or would you help us to be the kind of people that you're calling us to be? Would you bury these words of Jesus deeper into our hearts? Would you bring them to our mind, perhaps even in, in, uh, in, uh, in new uh, opportune ways, even in our comings and goings, in our day-to-day, -day, in our Monday through Fridays? Help us to be what you're calling us to be. Help us to be humble. Help us to act and live and love and serve and choose in humility. Lord, we confess this isn't easy or natural for us, but we also confess our faith in you, our trust in you, that you, by the power of your spirit, are changing us, can change us. Friend, if you're here today and haven't taken a step of faith and believing in Jesus, make today your day and turn to him. Humbly turn to Jesus. Lord, we're sorry for, for thinking we're rich, for having it all together, for laughing when we should, should be weeping placing a high priority out of being well thought of rather than placing our highest priority 
to be what you want us to be. Lord, forgive us, fill us, call us, bring us into your own, mold us and change us, we pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, friends, thanks for being with us today.